todo? Entonces ya la presentación ya está. No, pero ya. Ok, voy a repetir porque la presentación no salió en streaming. So now I'm doing it again. We're, we're, we're on. You can just do the whole lecture. So I'll do, I'll do the whole thing without the crazy thing, maybe. Okay. Okay. Entonces, gracias por haber venido. La, la conferencia será en inglés. Es un honor tener a Adam Harvey aquí con nosotros. Primera vez en México. Primera vez que va a, va a enseñar sus proyectos acá. Es, es un artista y un científico conocido, respetado. En muchos países ha estado... En, en varios continentes con su proyecto. Es maestro de la de School, uh, School of Visual Arts de Nueva York. Es egresado de New York University de, del curso de telecomunicaciones interactivas. Y su trabajo ha, sido, ha salido ya en todas partes, desde New York Times. Eh, vamos a ver qué hacemos con, con esa, esa música. Entonces, eh, bienvenido Harvey y ojalá les les encante lo que va a enseñar. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Y soy loco, also. Or some of the projects take that, take on that nature. The project on the screen right now is a form of camouflage from face detection. This is a project that I began in 2010 while I was working on my thesis. The idea with this project is that anybody can shield themselves from face detection. I think most of you know what face detection is. That's when uh, a webcam or a CCTV analyzes your face with an algorithm and it's able to isolate that facial region on you. Um, to make a distinction now, which will be helpful later, is that you hear two terms in the news. One of them is face detection and the other one is face recognition. And so face detection is merely a form of object detection where you know that that is a face, whereas face recognition is knowing that it's your face and identifying you from a database. What I discovered with this project is that you can defeat both of them because face detection always comes first. So if you can find a way to beat face detection, you can um, basically block face recognition, which is a very powerful technology used by a lot of law enforcement agencies around the world. And a small exploit such as this carries a lot of weight when it blocks such a powerful technology. And that's the, that's the idea behind the work I do, is finding a small weakness in a surveillance technology and then exploiting that as an art project or as a fashion collection. This is a research paper um, which explains something called the Doddington Zoo or the Biometric Zoo. Uh, this is interesting because it puts every one of you into four categories. So everybody's face is either a sheep, a lamb, a goat, or a wolf. And what that means is if you're a sheep, you're, you're a well-behaved face, you're easy to identify, and that's good for surveillance. If you're a goat, you're stubborn and sometimes difficult. You may have features that are unique uh, that make your face slightly more shadowed or angular or um, you know, more facial hair that makes it slightly more difficult to recognize you. And then you have lambs and wolves. And you definitely want to be more of a wolf than a lamb. A lamb is somebody with a feature set on their face who can be spoofed. And a wolf is someone who's good at spoofing. So you could say, um, actually, a model is someone who's very good at spoofing. Models are kind of like wolves because they dress up their faces or actors and they take on new identities. Um, lambs are the unfortunate victim where wolves can assume their identity, spoof their identity. And the, the, um, most everybody is a sheep goat, wolf, and lamb are all smaller subsets of that biometric zoo. But no matter um, where you fit in in that biometric zoo, the <coughs> this technique uh, that I developed called CV Dazzle is a way to thwart that from taking place um, and even classifying you as a biometric zoo. It's such a good example because it's literally 
um, making the analogy that people are animals and classifying you into a pen, into a zoo. So this image shows on the top two examples of when makeup and hairstyling is used in a, in a certain way that blocks key facial features. I mean, you can put on makeup until the sun comes up and still be recognized as a face. And if you look at examples from Polynesian islands with tribal makeup, usually it does not block face detection. And the reason is that that kind of makeup is enhancing facial features. So if you go to um, you know, a makeup salon or makeup booth and they're enhancing facial features on you by adding lipstick to make your lips appear more fuller or darkening the areas in, in the eyes, that actually makes face detection easier because that's an enhancing kind of makeup. It makes all your features more visible. So if you think about that and then do the opposite, what you really want to do if you want to evade face detection is to inverse all of that logic. And you want to make anything that's light, dark, and anything that's dark, light. And it works for any color skin, dark, light. If you have dark skin, you go the opposite. One thing you'll notice uh, about these images on the top, there's a bang that comes uh, quite far down on this area called the nose bridge. And this area, right in between your eyes and above your nose, is a, probably the most important area for face detection. And that's because it doesn't change very much. Whereas all of you have some facial hair, and that facial hair is different, and you have hair up here, and that's different, and some of you have glasses on, and some of you have earrings, so anything that's changing a lot, person to person, makes a really bad indicator of the face. So you want the most stable thing, and that happens to be the, basically the center of your face. The inspiration behind this project is a friend's Halloween costume, which involved no Photoshop, and I was really amazed that she was able to achieve this effect only with makeup. And I wondered that if it confuses me, how it could it confuse a machine also? Or could you develop something that would confuse a machine? <clears throat> Unfortunately, at least in New York, I'm not sure what your laws are here, but wearing a mask in New York City is illegal if you're in a group of three or more. And that can be interpreted by the police as they see fit. So if you're wearing a mask, you're subject to um, search by the NYPD. So masks are not a good idea to evade face detection. This is an example of how a good camouflage <clears throat> doesn't actually work if people don't like wearing it. On the left is a camouflage that was worn by US soldiers in the Persian Gulf War. And this was a camouflage that was made for a desert terrain, as you can see with the colors um, and little bits that might look like rocks. And it was um, referred to as the chocolate chip cookie pattern. <clears throat> Soldiers didn't really like wearing this because it didn't make them feel military enough. In other words, it didn't make them want to kill. It wasn't an effective camouflage for a soldier. And the story goes that it was retired and then it was later reissued to Iraqi soldiers. As the next step in researching this project, CV Dazzle, I scraped websites for fashion images and downloaded thousands of images, um, including party sites like last night's party.com, Cobra Snake, Nikki Digital, uh, fashion runway shows, hundreds of thousands of images. And then I scanned these for potential outcomes that would work for what I wanted to do. So maybe it's a little bit fast, but you can see in some cases that even if you have tinsel covering half of your face, you can still recognize the face. And in this um, is a good example of armor that's used to accentuate parts of your face. And that face was still recognizable. This one is not enough effect to change the appearance of the face. And Lady Gaga had some styles that did work and some styles that didn't work. You can see here in this really extreme makeup that adding a giant black blotch of makeup to your cheeks um, it's not going to solve the problem of evading face detection. And what it comes down to is the key placement in the certain areas that I mentioned, which is the nose bridge 
And one area I didn't mention, uh, which is adding asymmetry. If you go back to that, you can see there's one black and one white, and then it switches. People are symmetrical and faces are symmetrical. So you want to do anything that's opposite of um, what is expected. And the other interesting source of inspiration was a kind of camouflage. Some of you may be familiar, it's called Dazzle Camouflage. It was used in World War I. It's the most amazing design camouflage because giant warships were painted in this Cubist style. Um, even Picasso said that they had ripped him off and the tanks and the battleships that were using Dazzle were his work. But it's amazing um, to think that they would go through all the work of painting these ships in these style when there was some debate about whether it actually worked. And the way that it was supposed to work is if you look at this, you're not supposed to know if the ship is moving, if it's moving left, right, or if it's two ships, or if it's just one. So if you're launching a torpedo, that makes it difficult. And that's where the name Dazzle comes from, is that it would confuse um, the torpedo launcher on the other ship. To figure out what might or might not be working for this, these are test patterns that some of them look like uh, football camouflage, um, and some of them are like kiss the band makeup, and some of them work better than others. So when you simply add the black blotches under your eyes, I mean that would be a good one because it's socially acceptable. And like the cookie, the chocolate chip cookie camouflage, you need um, a style that's socially acceptable. So I began um, looking at OpenCV, which some of you, I think, are familiar with. Anybody work with face detection software? OpenCV is a technology that's open. So you can look at what's inside, and you can look at the profile for what defines the human face. And then you can see what the computer is trying to see. So here, there's a big peak in the middle, and that corresponds to that nose bridge area. This is an, a rendering of the files inside of OpenCV. <clears throat> and what you see is a dark rectangle and then a white rectangle. And the way that the algorithm works, uh, I won't get too technical, but it goes through uh, thousands of little calculations, and it looks at the average pixel uh, the average brightness of a certain region of your face. And if that difference is within a threshold, then it's good or it's bad. And if it has enough good ones, then it'll classify that part of the face, <clears throat> that part of the image as a face. So this will give you a better example. <clears throat> this is a visualization of OpenCV. And what you'll notice is it drops a rectangle or a square around a region of the face that it thinks may be an image. But the deal with biometrics is that everything is a probability. So anytime it finds a face, it's only a probability. And the goal is then either to find a face with a probability or to get low enough that it doesn't qualify in that probability range. So you can see it's overlapping about five or six, and that means that it's a fairly high confidence match for a face. Um, and I'll pause it here, and I'll ask if anybody knows the backstory on this image. Because if you do computer vision, you see this image almost everywhere. <laughs> Lena, I heard. Yeah. Good, nice one. Uh, Lena is a Swedish Playboy model that was first used for computer vision tests in, I think, the 1970s. And I think she's still, um, I don't know what she's been up to, but that would make for an interesting story. This image is very ubiquitous in computer vision world. And it also tells you that it's very male dominated. <clears throat> So this is an interactive software that I built to help me design patterns that can defeat face detection. And the way that it works is by drawing onto a face, and on the right side, 
you'll see these bars, and it's a graph showing you how effective or ineffective what you've done is. So some of you may be familiar with machine learning. What you can do with this program is keep doing trial and error human learning until you figure out what works well or what doesn't work well. And this is, this is what I used to design the patterns on that first image. And if you get a really good pattern, the gray rectangles will change to red. And the more red rectangles you have, the stronger the camouflage is. So what I'm kind of doing here is trying to cover the forehead with hair and then build that down into the nose bridge area. <clears throat> so that one works okay. It's kind of interesting that I started this project in 2010 and it wasn't until 2013 that I received an email from an intelligence agency um, who wished to publish it in a classified document three years after I had worked on it. And I'm going to skip ahead to a video. And this is also, uh, it's actually 2013. So I wonder if I have audio here. Is there an audio plug? Do we have anything? Okay. Well, I'll go back while they're working on that. These are a few of the other styles that I developed in collaboration with a New York City fashion magazine called Dis Magazine. They created these looks <coughs> and styled everything. And they're very um, bold. And I wouldn't expect you to wear these in public. Yeah, it's over here. Thanks. Um, but they show you how difficult it can be to evade face detection, kind of what's required. So a lot of hair is really helpful if you were to hide face detection. And for a guy, again, uh, bringing the hair down in front, you can see in the upper two images how that hair covers the important nose bridge area. These are some of the looks that did not qualify you can see how difficult that even if you're wearing a sleeping mask, that uh, computer vision can still see that you're a face. And there's another one. Even if you cover half of your face um, and put an eyelet through it just to see, that still is recognized as a face. OK. So let's see if um, audio comes through. Investigators in the Boston Marathon bombing had multiple images of both suspects. The technology okay. hundred times better. A million. Okay, so here's um, 60 Minutes is a hundred times better. Influential and popular program in the U.S. Some of you might may know it. Yet facial recognition technology is yeah, still a work a in progress. While investigators in the Boston Marathon bombing had multiple images of both suspects, the technology did. not this is an episode that came out after the Boston bombing, and the suspects were not identified with face detection. <clears throat> so there's a lot of doubt about how effective it was. Not come up with a match. They were not identified by their faces, but by their fingerprints. Authorities won't say what went wrong. One possibility is that government data banks for which the photos would have been searched are not big enough. As we discovered, the FBI is working on expanding its database. Businesses are tapping facial recognition to sell us stuff. 
and computer scientists are upgrading the technology. The story will continue in a moment. In the sense that my face does not walk around with a tag saying I'm Joseph Attic in the street. But marketers are working not just on linking our faces on the street to our name, but to our online profiles with our personal data and shopping history. We used to worry about privacy on the web. Now we have to worry about privacy just walking around. The link is between the online and offline persona is yeah. becoming possible, and that is right, because of our faces, exactly. With security cameras ever present, some people are already thinking up countermeasures. Artists, very clever artists, have now be began to create new forms of anonymity by creating patterns that would interfere with face recognition algorithms. So they can go down the street and the system cannot recognize them. We'll all wear masks. The veil will come here. The veil might come here. Short of wearing a burqa. I guess you can't hear that very well. But the, what the um, um, reporter said at the very end is that maybe this will lead to people wearing veils or burqas in public. Uh, by the way, this is the kind of thing that gets you a lot of red flags on your profile is um, being compared next to you know, FBI uh, programs and in the mainstream news. But that's a perfect segue to the next project that I worked on, <clears throat> which does involve a burqa. Uh, of course, recently drones have become pretty much a daily news item, and they're in now in use but by the FBI in the United States. And what we've seen happen is that this technology was developed for war in the Middle East. But now that we have this technology, it's coming home, and it's being used domestically. And that makes a lot of people worried, and it should. Um, because these machines are, are equipped and designed to target people with, with uh, projectiles. So in this video, what I want you to pay attention to is the way that the imaging happens. You can see people, but they're little white dots. Whoops. Close. Copy. Come back on those guys. Here we go. Yeah, another second. Are the people coming out of the mosque right now? Go for the vehicle. Secondary. Nice secondary. Vehicle. Guys are going wait. to town, man. First now running. There we go. Come on, box. There we go. We don't move it further. Ready. Flares away, flares away. Flares. And no joy load. Okay. Continue engaging. Pilot. Continue engaging. Get that person. Stop the flares. Stop the flares. Going out to gate. Oh, that's a correct job for give me 10 seconds. Roger. So what you can notice here is that it's very difficult and it's almost impossible to hide from that aerial surveillance because they're using thermal imaging to track people on the ground. <clears throat> Get ready! Get ready! He yes, went down to the ground. Yeah, he just dove on the ground. He's okay, moving back again. He's loaded. Um, right Moving here, somebody is, was hiding in the woods in cover, which in uh, a visible camera, you wouldn't be able to see them. But because it's a thermal imaging camera, you can't hide behind a bush. Uh, your heat still comes through. So it's a new, it's a new way of thinking about camouflage right with new types of cameras. <clears throat> Go ready. Go ready. And um, last year, I keep track of a lot of defense technology and where it's going. And I noticed one uh, notable post about an uh, initiative by DARPA to further develop this technology, the thermal imaging system. And they develop a breakthrough technology for it, which allows you to see even further and image people miles away. Um, and that's you know, great for surveillance if it's used in a positive way, but it's also 
opening the door for that technology to be abused. And when you can see people a mile or two miles away through pretty much anything, they also work great through smoke and through fog and through rain. And this type of imaging is used widely by uh, search and rescue teams as you can see through smoke very well if you need to get into a building. But in this case, it's being used as a defense technology. And I was interested in following this and seeing where it would go, but also exploring what the weaknesses might be. <clears throat> this is one of the cameras that's on the front of a drone, like a predator drone or a reaper. The areas in red aren't actually red. They just don't want you to see these camera um, parts of it. This is from their website also. But on a typical drone, you have, it's called an imaging payload system. So you have visible, you have really great, amazing optics for visual, but you also have thermal. So you can see in the night, you can see through fog, you can see in the daylight really far. Here's what that looks like. This is um, thermal footage shot by myself with what's called a FLIR camera. And as you can see, this was shot in the winter, so people are wearing a fair amount of clothes. If I were to have shot it in the summer, it would have been slightly violating some people's privacy. Here, it gets better. There's no audio on this one. You probably pick up on a few things about how this technology works by watching this and some of the weaknesses that it has. Uh, one of them is that as soon as that door closes, you can't see through it. And that's because glass is thermally opaque. So you can't see through glass with a thermal camera. It's reflecting. But you'll also see you know, probably a little bit too much of uh, some people that walk in. You can see a little bit through their clothes. It's, it's a very unflattering camera to be filmed with, too, by the way. And what you're looking at is heat. So instead of light, it's just um, the hot part. So, like, you know, areas like your armpits show up as very bright spots on the camera or anywhere that your body is generating heat is a brighter color. Anything that's cold is a darker value. You can see uh, my friends wearing glasses that those are also thermally reflective. And that he's going to light a cigarette and you can see the spark from the lighter. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much how any thermal imaging system works. Is uh, going to give you an image like this. They're very creepy looking images also. And all right, now I feel like I'm just Project scaring you. But I want to show this because this is a technology developed by you know a commercial a business in the U.S. who wants to develop and market a scope for tracking objects with computer vision. You track onto the object and then it fires at it. So I'll show you just a little snippet to give you an idea. Red tag and the system fires. That's just an uh, apple or something. Tag, track, exact. So, you know, that's cool, and that's a neat technology, and it's obviously smart what it's doing, but what if that scope is available to anybody who wants to buy it? That's not a really good thing, and that doesn't, it's not going to make you feel like you're living in a safe society when people can, you know, offload all of the, the imprecise capabilities of humans onto perfect machines for doing something um, like firing, firing uh, rifles. So going back to the veil, I decided that I would make something that <clears throat> addresses thermal imaging with drones. 
So I decided to make an anti-drone burqa. This is a burqa that I designed with my collaborator, Johanna Bloomfield, and it's made out of a thermally reflective fabric. The fabric is lightweight. It's about as lightweight and flowy as silk, and the interior is actually lined with silk. Um, it's a pretty expensive garment to make because it does contain silver. Silver is really good at reflecting heat. Um, it's not very cost efficient to make a garment like this. But it shows you that it's possible to make something... <clears throat> question. Does plastic reflect heat? Now, you can see heat will go through plastic. Um, yeah. So what you can see on the right is an image taken with a thermal camera and <clears throat> all of the body heat is hidden. Excuse me. Kind of the inspiration behind this is taking garments that are used in Middle Eastern dress, repurposing that as a technology um, where drones are being used domestically. So now the burqa becomes useful and semi-practical. Usually when you're looking at these images in the thermal spectrum to make it um, easier to understand, you apply what's called false coloring, and that helps you understand the gradient of black and white because our eyes are sensitive to colors and we can split that up into a spectrum and see where the hot areas are versus the cool areas. So you can see that where the face is exposed, a lot of heat is coming out of the burqa and underneath the visor at that point. Actually designing a completely thermal concealment system is beyond me and it's not even something that exists right now. But there are, and I keep track of research papers that come out about this, there's a lot of research right now going into thermal camouflage because what I do as an art project is not only interesting culturally to people who care about drones, but this is also interesting to the military, the Air Force, and the, in fact, the Air Force General Counsel um, retweeted a story about this. So I'm aware that they're aware, and there's a lot of people aware of this project. Um, as another design for this, my collaborator and I made a hoodie. And while, again, this is not a complete 100% thermal shield, you can see how it might work. We have an overhead surveillance system looking down at somebody and you want to uh, conceal your thermal signature. When I say thermal signature, I mean you, know, you as a human have a unique thermal appearance because you're going to be um, giving off heat in certain areas uh, as opposed to maybe a deer or something. It would look much different on a thermal system. And of course, there's also a hijab. And this you can wrap your upper body in and block heat in the same way. And it's printed with a custom silk on the background, on the underside. This is what I use to photograph the system. <clears throat> and the white camera is the thermal camera. I guess some competition. <laughs> and this is a um, semi-spooky lo looking picture of a handheld thermal system, which by the way, this technology, like most, developed in the military, slowly trickles down into the consumer market. And they cost a couple thousand right now. This one is a very nice thermal camera, and it's about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. You know, as opposed to the DSLR on the uh, attached to it, which is like two thousand. You can now get a handheld for, I don't know, two or three thousand. And you can see, I think, maybe it's a little hard, but you can see that the color match of the metal is about the same to the person in the burqa. And that was my project about drones. It led to a lot of interesting emails. Some of them, I think, were attempts to get me to reveal my anti-government intentions. Um, but I do this as a project to engage people in discussions about privacy and to provoke discussions at a policy level also. So these are art projects that I want 
a lot of people to discuss. Um, but for the next one, which I think is very relevant now, this is a project that I started in 2011, and it's actually really simple. So those metal fabrics that I used <laughs> in here, we have um, silver and other metals in them. They're very flexible and very light. We we'll use them as a conductive fabric for projects with Arduinos. You can run electricity through them, which is cool. But they're also good at blocking uh, wireless signals. So if you have you know, a router for your Wi-Fi that's operating at 2.4 gigahertz, your phone, uh, maybe it's 1.9 gigahertz or down to 800 megahertz. And those signals will reflect off of this metal fabric. So you can design what's known as a Faraday cage but make it completely flexible that goes inside your pocket. This project I launched this morning um, for my hotel room this is a Kickstarter for something called the Off Pocket. And the Off Pocket is simply a phone case. Put your phone in it, close it, and nobody can call you, nobody can track you, uh, your phone's unhackable. Uh, I know that when politicians and journalists travel to China, often they never bring their phone because if you even bring it there, you're running the risk of having your phone hacked and all the contacts um, downloaded off of it. So there are quite a few journalists who are interested in this. In fact, um, while some journalists working on some relevant news cases were intrigued by it, and I hope that it's useful to them. Um, and yeah, I'm excited that within the first couple hours, I've already raised a few thousand dollars. It's a project that has taken a lot of research to develop and test um, with different frequencies and at different um, intensities of strength. So I'm not sure how technical my audience is right now. <clears throat> But to give you an idea, there are products that are used by law enforcement agencies uh, to scoop up a bag at a crime scene. It goes in what's called a forensic bag, and that is supposed to protect like any tampering, anybody from messing with a phone. Um, and I know how strong these are, and I've tested some of them. And then there are um, ones that are a little bit stronger that are military specification items. These are Military specification ones were stronger than the law enforcement grade, but this one is even stronger than the military specification grade, and I'm making it for civilians. So I hope that is an improvement to privacy that anyone can purchase something um, that can you know, actually help with your privacy situation, whatever it may be. <laughs> um, what I would like you to think about as an audience, I hope that I haven't provided things that scare you, but things that um, show you that all surveillance and biometrics are not perfect technologies, but usually that their weaknesses are hidden from you. So I would ask you um, what you would think would be the changes that happen in surveillance that may impact your privacy in the next year, but also in the next five years and the next 10 years. And think about where we are now and obviously where we're headed is not a great direction, but what is that going to look like in five to 10 years? Some of the things that uh, you probably already know that big data knows about you, but maybe a few that you don't, you knows when you're driving by recording your license plate as you drive around the city. This is happening in London, this happens in New York, this happens a lot in California. Uh, maybe you don't have a car, so you don't care. But you probably email, and that's also very trackable. You text, call, what you buy, where you live, where you were last night based on your location, who you were with. You can tell if you're pregnant based on what you're buying with your credit card transactions. Your sexual preference, um, whether you're happy, depressed, maybe if you're sick, um, and who you will vote for in the next election. But also where it's going now, uh, has anybody seen the movie with Michael Douglas, The Game? Predictive analytics. Being able to determine your next step based on all of your previous steps. Um, this will be a technology that you'll see roll out more. It's already, in fact, been used to, I guess, accidentally bust up a ring of 
Chinese uh, stolen car dealers in the U.S. by Google. But some things that big data will never know about you is what do you buy with cash. If you buy anything with cash, people aren't going to know. In fact, in China, I think it is, cash, uh, people buy cars with cash. They'll walk around with suitcases loaded with cash. I mean, that's pretty um, unsafe to do in some large cities. But they'll bring the whole sum of money in a suitcase and purchase the car outright in cash. Amazing. Uh, big data also doesn't know when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody, when you're unplugged. So what do you do offline is kind of a unique space. And we're realizing that as the trackable surveillance space becomes larger, but also um, more visible as you're aware of programs like PRISM and X keystroke. Some things that you know, big data or possibly government does not like are things that I'm very interested in, but also things that anyone who works in security is very interested in. And I think these are areas that are really open for creating new work right now, that we're in the beginning where we're realizing what is happening in the surveillance world, and we're taking this in, and then we're putting stuff back out there um, that expresses how we feel about it, or ways to work around it, or business opportunities to make products that give you privacy. And I would say that you know, these days privacy is something that you either have to fight to get back or buy as a luxury item. And I'll end, not sure how I'm doing with time, with one of my favorite quotes from a historian, Roy Behrens, who wrote a book called Camelopedia. And he says that from all appearances, Deception has always been critical to daily survival for human and non-human creatures alike. And judging by its current ubiquity, there is no end in immediate sight. And that's it. Thanks. <clears throat>
And there are some alternatives uh, to using things um, that are different from Facebook, but that also also let you publish a stream of your activities and connect with people. I would say that there, there's one good thing about Facebook and that it's made privacy a dinner table conversation. That it's a proxy for talking about privacy. I don't think Facebook is good. It's actually very bad in its privacy policies. Um, and one interesting thing, I don't, sorry, I don't have an answer about what to do with it. It's uh, something that's kind of necessary for communication and it's good in that it outperforms other communication systems uh, for its messaging and connection capabilities. But it's going to take a societal, psychological change to shift people away from using it. But a problem with that is something I overheard at a biometrics conference in Rome, uh, I think last year or the prior year, and that um, countries need a way to identify uh, who you are and verify that identity. So Microsoft had been working on for a while, Microsoft Passport. I don't know if that's now defunct, but it definitely, it did not make it to the level of providing kind of a identity provider system like your passport does. But there is a real need for identity verification. And right now, it's either going to be Facebook or it's going to be Google um, who verifies your identity. And so if you opt out completely to both systems, it puts you at a disadvantage in terms of being able to identify who you are for key services, uh, maybe medical attention or receiving money, I could imagine problems like that. Okay, well, um, I agree with all this, uh, all this matter about pr protecting your privacy and stuff. But also, well, I believe that the market needs data. The, the market ne needs reliable data in order to produce things, to, pr to uh, comply with the needs of the people, whatever. Yes. Um, well, this is uh, w g gathering all this data from Facebook. It's quite like uh, re re reliable because it, it, it gives the market a better perspective on what the, the people uh, the people needs are, and also they prevent uh, capital crashes and, and stock uh, stock market crisis and, and whatever, because the investments are made better in this okay. kind of, in, in this kind of things. Uh -huh. What could you say could be uh, 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 an, an alternative for the market to gather all this information without violating privacy? I would say it's coming up with better terms and more informative ways of describing big data is such a kind of benevolent sounding term. But when that big data includes all of your likes and your browsing history and your credit card transactions, and you clump everything together under big data, it's not so benevolent because that's the kind of information that the Stasi would have dreamed of acquiring about a population. And there's an interesting graph that somebody made that shows the amount of information the Stasi had about citizens in Germany versus the amount of information that the NSA has. And the comparison is the amount of space that you're all sitting in the audience to Mexico City. Pretty close to that. It's a big difference. But I think the problem is just in terms of like dividing up big data into subsets so that we understand where our data is going. Because what I find, you probably agree, is that you're more than willing to submit your data if it's for something that's going to help you uh, or for a service that you want. And there's really no cost to you of giving away that data. But you need to know if you're giving it away because that's your data, so you should have the decision to do that. So I think it should be, people should still be developing like big data apps that make good use of this, but you have to know how people are using your data so that you don't, aren't abused by that um, question here. Yeah, I have a question about the first part. The, what gave you the, the idea of start as um, um, avoiding face recognition? And how do you este, um, end uh -huh. using fashion, fashion uh, to start? I worked as a photographer for a few years in New York City and I would photograph parties 
And this is right around the beginning of the 2000s. So what was happening then is digital cameras, the price dropped to the floor. Everybody could have a digital camera. Everybody does. And people were posting all those photos online. In New York City, at all the parties, people would take all these photos, post them online the next day, and everybody would look at how silly and scandalous people were doing things, taking their shirts off, and all the photos were up there. It's very entertaining, and some people are naturally voyeuristic, but what I found is some people felt violated when you took their picture, and they didn't know if it was going online or not. And the next thing is, once it goes online, there's a good chance that it will never come offline. So if you have a photo up there you don't like, you know, I, as a photographer, may be violating your privacy, um, and you may not like that. So I felt like that was a conflict for me, and I didn't want to continue working as a photographer doing that. Instead, I wanted to make interesting images, but I wanted to address what I saw as um, you know, a problem with contemporary photography, which is that you have to show it online, so you have to put people's faces online, and they don't always like that. Um, but what's another way of looking at photography is computationally through software like OpenCV and how that's affecting it. So in a way, this is a, the first project I showed is a photography project, but it's just a more interesting one, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know Berto had a question. <coughs> I know it's going to be good. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, probably not. But uh, thanks a lot, man. It was great, great speech. And um, have you been to Vegas with this makeup? I've received some inquiries, and I know people who work in the security business. Face recognition is a great technology for a casino to have because they can keep track of customers and keep tabs on people who may be rigging the systems. Turns out that one of the most effective ways of blocking face recognition, and this is straight from the mouth of a biometric CEO of a company who's um, had software on Hewlett Packard machines, and he said in response to my project, why don't you just wear a baseball cap? Because that does a great job. And you think about it, most cameras are above eye level, and if you have a baseball cap, it's going to block a portion of your face. It's a very simple thing that just about anyone can do. Um, it's not a criminal activity to wear a baseball cap, but it can offer you some privacy. And neither is wearing a hoodie a uh, criminal offense. But some people don't like that, and they won't allow you into the store. So again, it comes down to identity verification services based on being able to identify you. Like we're really slipping out of this partial age of anonymity that we've been enjoying for a little while. It's been fun. Maybe you could compare it to the reckless era of hippies and free love, our era of anonymity. But sadly, I don't think that it's going to last very long with the technologies that we've been developing. Thanks. Más preguntas? All right, well, if you don't have any more questions, if you're interested in this kind of technology, my website is ahprojects.com, and there's that new project that I just launched on Kickstarter, and hopefully that will lead to you know, funding I can use to research and develop more projects that kind of walk this fine line between government surveillance, citizen privacy, how to negotiate that. Thanks.